Hey guys, how's everybody doing? All right, we already got a few people in here, it looks like, so ready to get started. So I've gotten a few questions uh, privately through Messenger or YouTube, uh, what have you. Uh, one that I wanted to, to go over, it was quite a lengthy multi-part question this guy sent me and it was <clears throat> hey i was wondering if you could do a video on producing queens and the number of colonies you recommend for producing queens i am new and i have 12 colonies hoping to double that next year some questions i have is how many queen lines should i have is it reasonable for me to graft my own i can graft no problem but i'm going to get long-term results not inbred uh, do I just assume there are enough other colonies around or is there a book you can recommend that will answer these kind of questions? So these are some good questions and I'll start off with uh, his goal of doubling. If a colony is reasonably healthy, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to, to double your numbers. Um, for that, amount of colonies i don't see it being worthwhile grafting uh, the reason being is because to graft you need a cell builder your cell builder will require a lot of resources and tie up uh, at least two colonies worth of resources of his uh, in early spring uh, because that's when you're going to want to start you're going to be pulling uh, you're going to have to really rob them uh, knock them down and there's no put enough graphs in it to be worthwhile which is around 60. Uh, if you don't want to do 60 even if you did 40 but you don't need 40 cells 60 cells if you have 12 colonies um, so that's why i recommend uh, the flyback split until you get your numbers up closer um, over 50. Uh, more than that you know you could probably um, might want to probably look into grafting um, and a cell builder may be worthwhile at that point. So, <clears throat> how many queen lines should he have? Uh, in my personal opinion, one. Uh, I don't see any point in in trying to uh, beat around the bush with it. At that that small of a hive count, you're not going to be able uh, to maintain a line. Um, it's just science. Um, it's great. A lot of backyard beekeepers, um, I've been a backyard beekeeper myself where uh, you want to play with your lines and you get some results. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, to be able to actually maintain a line in a breeding program, you need uh, over 200 colonies. That's kind of a, a number that most people agree on. And like Rudner's books, uh, the Russian breeders association they have a minimum requirement of like two or 250 something like that colonies because that's the really the minimum that you'll need to be able to maintain a, a breeding program the reason i say i recommend one line is because uh, i think when you're raising bees like that consistency consistency is the biggest thing any queen breeder battles and that's your biggest goal is to is to create consistency in your line and with your bees, um, with a small sample like that, you're, you're wanting to look for similar things and diversity is really not going to be an issue for you. So I would concentrate on one line. Um, that way you can get more familiar and, and you know what you're looking for and maybe you can at least achieve some consistency with that. Um, long-term results in inbreeding so bees are livestock but unlike other livestock we don't have a one-on-one -on -one mating uh, a queen is going to mate with 15 to 20 different drones uh, so diversity is not going to be an issue for you um, diversity is always going to be your struggle uh, with a, a small apiary like that uh, most likely not in an isolated area 
You know, diversity is what you're going to struggle with. Diversity is what's going to keep you from getting consistent queens. I really don't see you having a problem with uh, inbreeding. Um, inbreeding can be a problem on in a breeding program where you're selecting from the same breeder queen, you're raising your drones off these same breeder queens, and you're mating in an isolated area. Um, but you're going to you're going to know real quick by, by your breeding patterns if you're starting to see that. Um, but in the normal beekeepers apiary, uh, inbreeding is not a, not going to be an issue for you. Uh, do I just assume there are enough other colonies around? No, don't assume that, um, and don't don't let other people contribute to your breeding line if you can help it. Um, you want to raise drones. The drone source colonies in your apiary are just as point just as important as is your queen mothers that you're grafting from. So you want to select your best colonies, and you want to. Uh, put drone combs in there and have them actively producing drones for your mating nukes. You want to saturate the area with the drones that you want to use. Now, as we said, uh, diversity and the no all these other bees that she's going to catch some from other hives and colonies, but hopefully you can put out enough that you get a consistent type of bee showing up in, in your apiary. So, um, don't assume that you got a bunch of drones around. Um, you really need to, if you're if you're making cells and you're making queens, you need to be making drones. Is there a book you can recommend that will answer these kinds of questions? Yes, there is a book that will answer every technical question that you have about bee breeding, how many drone source colonies you need per mating nukes, uh, how to set up your drone colonies, how to set up your mating yards, all these things. And that book is called uh, Breeding Techniques and Selection for Breeding of the Honeybee by Frederick Rutner. Now, <clears throat> this is not a uh, joyful read. It is not something you're just, it's not a page turner. Um, and there's a lot in here that may be over your head when you when you read through it and you'll revisit and go back. But it is a it's a complete handbook for a queen breeder or a serious queen breeder, in my opinion. Now, if you're wanting something less technical than that, uh, there's a there was a beekeeper, uh, Jay Smith. He has a book called Better Queens. It focuses uh, hugely on nutrition, which is, I mean, it's just paramount in, in queen rearing. Uh, and it's a good book. He's a good author. It's an easy read uh, with lots, lots of, of great knowledge of in that book. So that book, again, is uh, Jay Smith, Better Queens, uh, the first steps and things like that. So let me scroll back through these comments. I have some other questions that I had uh, had queued up, but um, looks like we're getting quite a bit in here. So let's see. Talking about the weather and the rain. We are in a drought in my area and we could really use some rain. So if y'all can send some my way. It would be awesome. Raise extra queens for your neighborhood. Houston Shelton bees. That's an excellent point. You know, if you're trying to raise a specific type of bee and you got neighbor beekeepers, maybe they don't care what kind of bees they have. Maybe they just want the cheapest bees. You be the cheapest bees. You be the free bees. Well, uh, provide them with queens, good quality genetics that uh, will benefit you. It's chess, guys. It's it's chess. It really is. Gus, when are you going to start selling Russian queens? I sell Russian queens now. I just sell locally. Um, so when I start making my queens in the spring, uh, mo they all go to nukes. Um, 
I get more profit from nukes and there is more demand locally for nukes than I can even ever feel. Um, so all my early queens go to nukes. Then when I start raising queens to sell in uh, late June and July, it's terribly hot here. Um, and I, I have concerns about shipping and being a small producer, I really can't eat the cost of shipping and uh, replacing queens like that through the mail when I have uh, local demand that will take everything extra that I produce. But um, eventually, I would love to be able to ship queens. I would like to grow more and more into, into queen ring because it's much easier on my back. Tyler S says, how far from mating yards do you recommend to place drone colonies? I honestly would not want my mating yards more than a mile away. Uh, often I place my mating yards on the outskirts of my yards, um, not far at all. Uh, I try to have yards that are mm, roughly three miles apart. Maybe uh, it just depends if you, but in all my yards, I'm cranking out drones. I don't, one thing don't do enough of is moving my drone source colony uh i do have plans for that i've been talking to my buddy billy joe about that uh, we raised queens together in the spring and um uh, planning definitely to move more drone source colonies not just our breeder queens and have those set up way ahead of time so i think that's important but to answer your question i really uh, i like to have them close and i know some people uh prefer to have them a mile away or, or a certain distance away i i don't i like to have them very close to the the main yard um i believe uh that drones escort the virgins to the dcas uh dcas are drone congregation areas my personal theory is that uh, the queen doesn't just fly out and wander and find uh a, a DCA. I think DCAs are developed around uh, large apiaries. I think that they may go to the same spots year after year, but because those apiaries are there, I think if there weren't any hives there, they wouldn't just travel 30 miles to make a, a drone congregation area. So saying that, I feel that um, the drones always escort the virgins out. In my observations, you'll make up mating nukes and you won't have any drones in there. You go back and you check on these cells, see if they've emerged and things will be chock full of drones. Them drones find the virgins. I've also observed in my mating yards that typically these these virgins aren't flying solo. They, they have escorts. Uh, sometimes they're much larger and sometimes they're smaller, but they will be a tiny almost like a tiny swarm that will escort, escort her away and, and back. And usually they're chock full of drones. So um, that's my opinion that drones escort the queens. Let's see. What else do we got? Oh, hey, Cayman. And hey, everybody else that I have not said hello to. I am... Uh, really bad at, at being able to focus uh, on that chat. So if I don't call you out personally, I'm sorry. Cayman Reynolds says, I tried to film a video on using a push-in cage on a queenless colony. Queenless no brood three days ago, had a queen today laying eggs. Fuzzy queen, broke my heart. Yeah, man, they find their ways in there sometimes. Um, on that note, I did have a question or a comment that I had uh, screenshot uh, from uh, one of my one of my YouTube videos. Uh, bear with me just a second, and I will scroll through here and find it. Da 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 da. Sorry, guys.
So this person says that they put three push in cages in last week. Two were successful, but we caught our queen under the edge of the cage because I couldn't see her coming out. And also they were fighting off bees um, while they were trying to install this queen. So on push in cages, I would recommend for you to, to find your frame of emerging brood and shake the bees off. Just shake them off in the nuke and turn it away however you need to. These bees are emerging. So she's going to have attendance within within minutes, most likely, right? So it's no problem. Shake these bees off. Then lay your cage how you want it, where you want it. Uh, uncover the hole for her. Place the cage in. Give her a second. She'll come out. Tip it up. Pull it out. Uh, also, something that I, I recommend is that you handle queens often. Um, to build up your confidence. The more confident that you are in these manipulations, um, the less likely you are to have a, a tragic ending. Uh, if you're comfortable with picking up queens, uh, grabbing bees, uh, handling that queen, and you, and you don't hesitate, and you're not scared of hurting her, um, then you probably won't have these kinds of issues. So, the only way that you can get to that point is by handling them, by picking them up. So if you saw, if you spot a queen while you're doing an inspection, you're not going to hurt her. Pick her up by the wings and transfer her to one hand with by the legs or just handle her around, hold her however you would like to hold her, place her back on the frame. Um, build up that muscle memory and that confidence. That way, if you get into an issue and the bees, uh, they're trying to ball this queen, they're trying to sting her, you can confidently reach down and pick her up and move any bees away and recage her and no sweat. You're not scared or, or worried about it. So it'll save you some heartache later on. So yeah, just my advice is get comfortable with it and uh, also remove the bees from the frame. That way you don't have problems because it can be annoying when you're trying to do a pushing cage and they keep running back and forth and covering it up. Wesley Bumpers, thank you for, for that. I appreciate that. Cayman's got a video coming out tomorrow on mating nukes and Corey Stevens VSH Queens. I will be watching that. Gus, do you often have to deal with pollen in your honey frames? What's the best way to remove it? Typically, no. I, I don't have to deal with pollen in my honey frames. Um I use excluders and the way that I manage my bees um, is to reconfigure the brood nest and build up into the honey making process. I'm not just waiting for them to need a super and slapping a queen excluder on and throwing the super on. Uh, I'll go ahead after I knock them back in the spring uh, and set the queen excluder set a super on and let them understand what space they have and reconfigure that brood nest as they build up and i generally don't have problems i, I don't think i'm explaining that very good because um it's kind of complicated but uh hopefully you get the point of it gus do you produce queens in august i i don't um i may try i generally try a little bit of uh fall splits as experiments each year because I suck at it. I'm horrible uh, with with fall splits. I have a very bad track record. Uh, lots of guys have great luck with it. Uh, lots of large scale guys uh, even around here split in the fall and have excellent luck with it, but I have not had that luck. Uh, when I figure it out, I'll do it on larger scale, but until then, I'll just keep playing around uh, generally my problem are uh, small hive beetles my second problem is I don't have enough drawn comb I feel like after the summer solstice it's an effort to get bees to draw comb uh, and not just an effort it's it's difficult uh, so if I had a surplus of drawn out comb that these bees wouldn't have to draw out anything and I fed and just focused on build up um, I feel like I could do much better, but generally I don't have uh, all that comb at that point. 
usually in August still most of my surplus of uh, deep combs are full of honey because uh, I use resource hives to draw them out and I, I'll have them in the spring but usually still in the fall even still uh, they're they're loaded with honey How many queen mating nukes would you recommend for each yard? So it, it's not necessarily the yard. You kind of want to focus on your drone source colonies, how many drone frames are in there. If you have a good drone source colony, that's probably good for about 20 mating nukes. In the first year of beekeeping from swarms only, what is a realistic amount of comb to expect to hope for per colony. Um, it really depends on when you caught that swarm, honestly, uh, and your area and the flow. Uh, here in my area, if you caught a swarm in May um, and caught all the flows, I would expect that swarm to pull out two deeps and maybe even two supers. Uh, but I would say at least two deeps if it decides to stay in the box. That's the other problem with swarms. It's probably going to swarm off on you. Bruce Southern says, hey, Pierce, I'm trying a small batch of Russian queens that I got from Stephen Coy this year. I think that you will be very happy with them. Uh, one thing is just understand what kind of bee they are. They're they're very uh, environmentally sensitive. They're flow sensitive bees. Um, they're not brood factories. Um, they're responsive to feed and pollen, but uh, that queen will shut down if she don't have nothing in there. Let's see. Where else are we? Well, I um, I lost some of these questions, but let's move on to some uh, some honey questions. So I've had several comments on the cleanup um, in between extractions or the end of the year. For me, I don't do a full cleanup. I did a short video today. Um, I don't like to do the full cleanups because it's a waste of my time and efforts. I clean the outsides of my equipment and all the sticky up. Uh, for me, it's very important to stay clean while. So that helps a lot. If there's ever any honey in the floor, uh, we stop immediately and we wipe that up. Or if I'm by myself, I stop immediately and I clean that up. Um, so end of extraction cleanup, uh, I will shovel out all of my cappings into my capping smelter i will then wipe down all the outside areas of uh, my equipment any knobs or switches and things like that or outside surface areas that uh, could be sticky uh, i'll wipe them down with the degreaser and I'll spray them again with bleach water uh, with the floor i use purple power degreaser uh, purple power degreaser will dissolve propolis off the floor. It'll leave just a brown puddle. So uh, I'll spray the floor down with that degreaser. Then I'll spray a little bleach on top of that, hit it with the water hose and wash it out. And then I'm good to go um, until next extraction. I leave the insides of everything sticky. Um, the honey, it, it doesn't spoil or anything like that. So it's it's not a real problem. Oh, yeah, my sump. Um, I had a couple questions on, on what do I do with the sump. For the sump, I just take a metal spoon and I skim off all the, the cappings and wax and stuff that's in there into a paint strainer bag and a five-gallon bucket. I suspend that paint strainer bag, and I, I leave the rest of the residual honey in the sump until uh, next extraction. Let's scroll through here. I had two small three-frame mating nukes get robbed, and they killed both newly mated queens. 
hard to protect small hives from the big ones. That is um, very true and a very real problem, especially uh, in dearth times. Uh, queen rearing uh, gets more difficult in the summer with the heat. It also gets extremely difficult in a dearth period, um, not only for that reason, but for um, drone saturation or drone population issues. Uh, typically, your, your queens, they don't raise drones in periods of dearth. Uh, and robbing, man, can be very rough. So uh, keep your entrances on your mating nukes very small. They don't need a lot of space and don't let your uh, mating nukes get too big and you won't have any heat or ventilation issues in them. Let's see. Da, da, da. Well, I think I've caught most of these questions here. All right, guys, y'all got anything? Gus, how do you make your hot honey? Uh, that's proprietary, guys. That's um, I feel like I have a, a pretty good product with that. Uh, I will tell you, you want to start with some very dry honey. Uh, if you can, you know, somewhere between 16 and 17 percent moisture content. And it's best to use uh, fresh and dried peppers. I feel like fresh peppers impart flavor that you'll never be able to get from dried. Uh, but the dried peppers, they do provide heat and, and some flavor uh, without jacking the moisture content up. Uh, those fresh peppers will definitely drive your, your moisture content up, so you got to be careful about them. But I hope that helps you somewhat. Well, oh, 35 supers of sourwood today. That's a, that's quite a paycheck right there. Any certain peppers you don't recommend to use. If it doesn't taste good, don't use it. Um, that's about the best that I could tell you. Uh, I like peppers that have floral and citrus notes in them because I feel like they pair well with the honey. Um, if you're using dried peppers, just, uh, you know, taste some of this stuff. You don't want nothing bitter or acrid in there. That's just not appetizing to you. What cases do you use for your comb honey? The hard cases or the cheap flimsy ones? Where do I get them? I've used about every kind of container for comb honey that, that I've found. Uh, I've used the flimsy clamshells from Date Ant um, a lot. The problem with those is that they don't seal, and we have these very tiny little ants here that they get in there, and uh, such a pain in the butt. Uh, you, you really, you know, they get in there, you can't do anything about it. You kind of lose the comb. Um, also, you can't stack those clamshells. I mean, you can stack a few tall, but they won't support weight and they'll collapse in on each other and ruin the comb. The hard shells are, the hard cases are very expensive. Um, man, it's it's painful ordering those. Uh, I typically order those from Blue Sky because uh, they're the cheapest ones that i found, Blue Sky Bee Supply. I did uh, order a thousand containers from a uh, uh, maple syrup supply company that also supplies like some honey bottling products. It's a Canadian company. I think it's DG or something. Um, I talked with a fellow from, uh, uh, well, he's pretty active on the commercial beekeeping group on Facebook. His name's Eugene Roman. He's a Canadian uh, beekeeper and he has a winery and he produces a lot of home honey and I admire his business model uh, so I reached out to him I liked his packaging so I ordered a bunch of these but uh, they are not see-through around the bottom they have a clear lid and uh, kind of a tannish bottom uh, I think they're a handsome case and they're very very cheap compared to uh, those hard cases
Could you dry it again after you add your fresh peppers? So with honey, it's hard to dry in the bucket because it's surface area, right? In a bucket, you have a round, small area of surface area. You got to dry it. You got to stir it. You got to keep doing it. So yes, you could. But the amount of time and labor that you would have in the product, it really, you know, you kind of, you got it. When you're selling things and you're doing things for profit, um, you can't think of them in the same way that you do when you're doing them for a hobby. Um, because time matters. So you, the amount of time that you would have in trying to dry it again after you added your fresh peppers, um, I, I wouldn't fool with it. You just, it's much simpler and more cost effective to use dry honey to begin with. And you can achieve a really good product with a less than 18 and a half percent moisture content using fresh and, and dry peppers. Do you make mead with any of your honey? I made mead one time. Uh, I aged it for a year and I entered it into the Memphis Area Beekeepers Association honey show and I took second place. Uh, and there were only two entries. It tasted like rocket fuel. It was uh, disgusting. It's supposed to mellow after a year. It did not mellow whatsoever. Uh, I used champagne yeast. Uh, I, I followed all the directions. Uh, just the alcohol content in it was too high, and it was just very unpalatable. So, uh, no, I leave the mead making to the to the experts, or at least the people better at it than I am. Trying to raise a queen in a two-frame nuke, how long from egg to laying queen? Well, uh, about 30 days, whether she's in a 10-frame box or a two-frame box. It's going to be the same on that. Anyone do much with canola? I've heard it crystallizes quickly. I have never been on or near canola crop. Uh, can't speak to that. Cotton. Uh, is notorious for crystallizing fairly quickly. Uh, most of our honeys here in the upper delta will uh, crystallize relatively quickly, uh, but cotton a bit faster than most. Can you post a link in the comments? I don't know if you can or not, but are you asking me if I can post a link, a uh, link to what? If I see chalk brood, it's in the spring and goes away fast, but this year I've had it bad continuously since the last long cold spring. I've requeened all of them. Why would it be so bad this year? Uh, you may want to consider changing your combs. Uh, you may want to change your apiary site. Um, if you're in a damp area, uh, you're probably going to see a lot more of it consistently. Um, changing out your queens should do it i would ask if you just requeened or allowed them to requeen themselves or did you requeen them from a different line um, some bees are just more susceptible to that kind of thing uh, particularly bees that aren't very hygienic so uh, i check on that and uh, possibly uh, phase your combs out and change your apiary side if it's not the queens With mead, I have found that back sweetening helps a bunch. Well, I don't know what that is, but I could guess. And that probably would have helped that batch because it was it was dry and. Uh, ugh. Oh, a link for the comb honey containers with the tan bottom. I will have to search for that because I had to. I don't. It's not something I could just Google and, and find for you. Uh, I'd have to go back. Uh, through my emails for an invoice on that because uh, they're they're not easy to find. But uh, send me a message and remind me, and I'll, I'll try to get that to you. Uh, depending on how many you need, I know you're you're relatively close to me, so um, if you don't need a whole bunch, you know, I, I can probably help you out with some I got. Uh.
Gus, what was the company that made uh, that remade the spiral cell protector? That is uh, Pierce Beekeeping. Pierce Beekeeping. Uh, they make hot knives and uh, lots of cool stuff, really. But they're very well known for their for their hot knives, them capping knives. Uh, it was Anura that uh, remade those, and they have them listed on their website. And I'm, I'm my giveaway is still going on, guys. I have not reached. Uh, 2,000 subscribers yet. I think I'm uh, close to 1,700. Uh, but uh, the secondary giveaway in that giveaway is a is a pack of uh, those spiral wire cell protectors. So uh, if you guys can help me out, if you're not subscribed, if you would, I'd appreciate it. Are all of your queens Russian? Yes, uh, all of my queens are Russian. That I can help some. I'm sure. Uh, are of varying degrees, um, but I'm working on that. Maybe in some of my out apiaries, I can't um, can't say that everything I have is uh, up up to snuff. Um, hopefully, everything that I'm raising queens off uh, high percentage. I have I haven't done my my testing yet. Um, that'll be very soon, but. Uh, I would say that yes, all of my queens are at least a very high percentage Russian. Do, do, do. Alhambra Orchard and Apiary has sold out this year already, but wanting to plan ahead for next year. That's always good, man. Uh, we did just one box to see how it would go. We're going to increase that to between five and ten next year. Uh, this year, I, I have not met my comb honey goal. I have produced uh, much less. I'm probably looking at about the same amount that I made last year when I was trying to double that. Um, they have not wanted to pull comb for me this year the way uh, they have in years past. Uh, all around this year, the weather and everything, um, it's been very frustrating. I'm working on sunflower honey, Gus. Did you say that you don't care for it? Uh, so, yes, I did say that I don't care for it, but I do like to make it. Uh, people love it. Um, it sells well. Uh, it's an interesting varietal to have. Um, my farmer did not plant his sunflower field this year. Uh, the weather, like I said, we all kinds of problems. Typically, he plants pretty good field of sunflower for me. Uh, well, not just for me, but I like to think it's for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't like the, I personally don't like the flavor of, uh, of sunflower honey. It's just a personal thing though. It's, it's a good honey and people love it. Back sweetening helps cut the alcohol. Just remember to stop the fermentation process first. See so guys, y'all are y'all are talking over my head on this stuff. Um, I don't know much about the the process. Uh, at the time I made it, I, I bought a uh, carboy, a three gallon carboy. A um, I think it's called a rack. It was a hard plastic tube with a, another tube and. It's for siphoning off, so you can filter that uh, the crud out. Uh, I had a secondary vessel and all that stuff. Uh, at the time, I, I was trying to do it the right way. I just failed at it. Uh, but, you know, we can't be the best at everything, and we can't win every, every time. So uh, I'm going to leave that to you guys for the mead. Gus, any tips on keeping momentum going this time of year? It seems like even with feeding directly after the flow, they still slow down and lose drive. Looking to draw more comb, Central Texas. Yeah, uh, man. As soon as the flow is over, you got to you got to keep that feed on them. You got to do a stimulative feed. Uh, you may have to feed them um, every week. You know, you want to keep it going. Uh, you, you're not trying to put weight on them or dump them, so you may need to. Uh, figure out a different type of feeder so that you can keep the feed coming in, a thin feed, not something that they can just take and store away uh, because, you know, you're not trying to put weight on them. You're trying to keep them going. 
So uh, the way that you feed and the type of feed that you're feeding could help. Uh, also, uh, I recommend uh, using nukes to draw comb uh, in a in a vertical setup. In a in a vertical setup, they outproduce as far as comb drawing. Um, 10 frame deeps and, and so on. Uh, my four over fours, man, they are comb drawn machines. Uh, they always do really well. But like you, you've you observed, after the summer solstice, it can be really difficult to get comb drawn. Um, but just keep going at it. The, the hives that want to pull comb for you, keep them pulling comb. Feed them that light syrup. It's uh, where they can have to work for it a little bit and keep it on them, keep them stimulated, make it feel like a like a flow as best as you can. This year was tough. I had one hive that far and away outperformed the rest. I have several that should have made honey but barely put anything away. It happens that way, man. Um, question though, uh, your your boomer hive, did it happen to be on one end? of the hive stand or the other or was it in the mix i got five boxes of comb honey due to your inspiration i cut down several drawn medium combs to encourage them over the excluder then remove them that's that's nice man and those five boxes of comb honey uh, they're going to uh, be very good profit for you uh, much more so than your extracted honey. So I, I love doing comb honey. It's just, it's not as easy. <laughs> Any tips on introducing virgins to mating nukes? For example, do you pull mated queen for a week before? Uh, no, and I may tweak this, but right now what I'm doing is I'll pull queens and within um, about no more than about three days, I come back because I, I try to cut their own cells down because uh, it seems to be an issue. I'm st starting to try pulling queens and then introducing at the same time. I just haven't had a whole lot of luck with that. I, I've been playing around more with virgins. Uh, and I am finding that banked virgins, virgins that have been banked for about a week, uh, are readily accepted uh, at a much higher rate than uh, me trying to walk them through the front door, young ones, or, or even the sales. I don't know why this is. Um, it's just an observation I'm making due to the uh, instrumental insemination queen project that I had going on. I had a, a surplus of, of virgins and um, man, those ones that, that were banked, I had no problems. Uh, almost, I don't know, I'd say like nine out of 10. I know that that's not accurate, but it's the best I can do off the top of my head. Uh, we're accepted and, and laying within a week. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely going to play around with that a lot more. Uh, but uh, prior to that, I would walk my virgins through the front. I'd let them go in the front on their own volition. I would uh, open the cage, set it at the entrance, and let her go out and go in, march in as she pleased. Because um, they seem to do that in nature. I know I've had plenty of them end up where uh, I didn't want them to be. One away from the left in a row of five. Wondered about drift myself. Hive next to it did one super on the very end. Well, color, the color of the hive, I mean, it, it was on the end. Maybe the color stood out more or something. It very well could be drift or it could just be a uh, awesome queen. Uh, I'd mark that hive and watch it, you know, that could be a, a good candidate to grab from or, or at least raise drones from. Um, but oftentimes the reason I asked him the position is because oftentimes your, your hives on the end of a row, one row or the other, or even if it's a long row in the middle, uh, you'll have drift and they will out 
typically in in all my apiaries anyway uh, they will outproduce the other colonies not because the queen is better but because of the position of the hive and just the nature of bees and drift sweet harlan honeybees well I'm, I'm glad you caught one man um throw some questions out here at me let's keep it going What is the best way to market comb honey? That's going to be um, different wherever you are. So what I recommend to you is figure out what kinds of people like comb honey, uh, cultures and nationalities, uh, because some definitely prefer it over others, and find out if uh, you have um, neighborhoods or groceries or, or things like that that are predominantly um, those people and target them in your marketing um, for for me uh, there are a lot of uh, Middle Eastern people in the Memphis area and they love comb honey they prefer comb honey they tell me this uh, so through word of mouth and also uh, you know uh, targeting those those smaller stores and trying to find customers and things like that. Uh, I have a very large Middle Eastern population uh, that I can't fulfill all all the comb honey needs there. So that's that's my area. Now, when I lived in in Southwest Virginia, a lot of older people want comb honey, but they don't want to pay what it costs or what your labor is is worth for you really uh so there wasn't a whole lot of point in in making it uh if there's not value added then uh, it may not be for you and if that's the case then i recommend that you start small and build your market if you don't already have a market there that, that wants it build a market uh advertise it uh, make lots of posts about what you can do with it how great it is um Blow it up and, and build your market and build your clientele. How much do I sell my comb honey for? Typically about a dollar an ounce, um, but it don't always work out that way. Like a, a two by four hard case uh, wholesale would be considerably less, but like at my honey stands, I sell them for $10. I don't do the the larger four by fours as as often really because uh, most people that are just buying that smaller quantity comb honey, in my experience, they just want to try it. Uh, they just want it for the novelty of it to look it or to try it. So uh, the price tag on the the larger four by four they just don't move very well. Uh, so I sell a lot in the frame, and I sell a frame of comb honey for uh, a shallow frame of comb honey for $35 but I'm not selling individual frames to people there is a, a 10 frame minimum because you got to buy a box of the whole super do you do mite washes on all your colonies or just those having issues no I do uh, an average like it depends on how many colonies that I have in that yard I will pull samples from random colonies. Um, if there's 30 colonies, maybe I'll pull um, samples from three colonies in that yard randomly. Um, when you're trying to, to get a bigger operation going or have bigger yards, more colonies, you don't have time for, for all of that uh, treating hives individually. You treat hives as a yard if that makes sense to you um ones that have issues if if they're visibly having issues before i treat annually i treat once a year um if having big issues before then then i'm going to pinch that coin odds are it's going to show up around now to a little bit uh, later on now here in late summer early fall i'm gonna pinch that queen and stack that hive up i'm not going to uh, baby them i don't want that i want mite resistance i want bees that survive and do well with it so i'm not uh, not babying ones that are having issues saying that uh thank god and i've worked 
hard on it, but I don't have a lot of my issues. Can you have too many frames full of old pollen? Should I take them out before winter? Man, yeah, you, you can, but the odds that you do probably aren't that great. Um, they're going to need that pollen in the spring. So it just, but they can become pollen bound. So without actually looking at your situation, it's hard to say, but yes, they can, they can become pollen bound. Um, yes, pollen can get old and dried out and the bees won't use it. And they, sometimes they're reluctant to clean it out. Um, but most times they need a lot of pollen and some, some types of bees, uh, hoard pollen, like crazy Russian bees hoard a lot of pollen. Um, uh, but they, they need it. What are tips to get the bees to draw a cut comb foundation? I had a super on and the bees never touched it. Well, it sounds like you didn't have the right age bees in there. Um, in order to get cut comb drawn out, you have to have a very balanced colony and it needs a lot of young bees in it that are able to pull that, that comb out. And if they're not pulling your comb out, then you don't have the right age bees to, to pull that comb. I'm going to attempt the OA dribble. Can't fork out the money for that. Well, you know, it's better than nothing. So give it a go. How long will a queen last? Uh, how long will she last and how long I will let her last are different stories. Uh, about two seasons. But she could last four. Uh, typically, I see most of them failing in their second to third year anyway. Uh, usually around third year. But one thing that is worth looking at uh, is queen longevity. Uh, I would like to do better